I want you to listen up closely because I know you have a desire to be a good dad, a good father, as well as all of us in here, how we can remember our own fathers, whether they're alive or whether they've gone on to glory. There are principles here that they communicate that comes from the Father's heart of God. I didn't make that up. This particular message has that flavor in it when you go back and take a look at it. Because I want you to understand when we talk about something that's being impeccable, we talk about something that does not have fault or blame or flaws. And then when we talk about a conduct, we talk about a behavior that reflects that. So not only was Paul thanking these people, not only was he saying my motives are right, but my conduct was in line with what it is I was trying to communicate. Just like a father would try to communicate to his wife and to his children. Not only that his words are making an impact, but watch this, his behavior and his conduct. Children watch their fathers. Moms watch their husbands and how we lay out this conduct and the way we say things and how we do things is, in, is important to the foundation of a family. And, and so what we see here is the way that this trio, now watch this, Paul, Silas, and Timothy handles the Thessalonian church. Now, the way they handle them, because Paul is writing this back to them, is the same way our Heavenly Father handles us. And you're going to see this principle. You're going to see six of them here. And then we move on and say not only how our Heavenly Father handles us, but we also see that this becomes a motto. Watch this. It becomes a model of how earthly fathers, watch this, desire to handle his family. I don't know any father that I've ever met that didn't have a desire to handle his family with impeccable character. Not a single man I've ever met have, have always desires that. Now, even though we find ourselves missing the mark, even though we find ourselves messing up at times, the desire within a man is to reflect the heart of the real father. And regardless of the kind of relationship you've had with your dad, that, 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 that should never be an excuse for you not to be a good dad because you've got a heavenly dad that's the dad of us all. Amen and amen. These principles are great. And Paul and Timothy and Silas is just communicating this back. And I'm sitting up here reading this, getting ready to communicate this to you. And I'm thinking about my dad and the way he treated me and, and the way I looked at him and, and how I sized him up. And I begin to look at these scriptures and go, wait a minute. That was his desire. That was his heart. That was the target. He wanted to do these things. Right on. Right on, Judah man. But, 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 but what we see here, if, if I could sum up these scriptures right before we chop them up, is that it was with impeccable conduct. It was with impeccable conduct that Paul and Silas and Timothy both, watch this, comforted the Thessalonians and yet challenged them at the same time. With the love of a father. And, and a father has to be firm but loving at the same time. A father has to confront but at the same time lay boundaries at the same time. And that's what Timothy and Silas and Paul are doing. They, 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 they had to comfort these people. They had to speak very, very bold to them. It's a balancing act. Because on the one hand, the speech was bold. It was forceful. 
But on the other hand, the actions were characterized. Now, you listen to me. The actions were characterized, right this, by gentleness and the motivation of love. Because the young boys grow up, uh, you know, running in the walls and trying to be tough and wrestling alligators and all that stuff. And sometimes what's forgotten in the growing up is the tenderness that God also puts in a man. And fathers ought to show that side as well. And so when you hear these scriptures, you're going to see this. You're going to see this. Now watch as we dive back into these scriptures, pop it open for you and see if you didn't get this kind of treatment from your father or either he was trying to and didn't know how, but as a father, you men here, You should treat your family the same way through these principles. But we prove to be gentle. Now notice that word gentle. That word means mild and kind. Not weak, not timid, not plastic, but mild and kind. And then he gives this... uh, this, this, this metaphor of this motherly example. And he says, among you as a nurturing mom. And I re- remember as Vicky uh, was nurturing our kids in a very young age and they were, they were still breastfeeding and, and, and how careful she was in, in taking care of them. And, and it's important, uh, you know, that, 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 that as I looked at that uh, particular example, I said, you know what, just like she is tenderly caring for Alex and Justine at a very young age, and they're still breastfeeding, so me as a dad should be tenderly caring for my kids as well. And, and, and it was important. And so this, this, this principle that was here was saying that, that, that there's this motherly example and the tenderly care means showing, watch this, concern. Concern for something that is fragile. Concern for something that is developing. And, and he says, look here in the end of this verse as his own children as her own children so so this father was looking like looking at this mom and how she was taking care of these kids he too had to develop that principle in him so one of the things that you see here is the first thing is is that one of the things that a father should always have within him is an act of gentleness an act of gentleness because there are times uh, when I had to tighten up my kids just a little bit. And they were very young. And Vicky said, make, make, make sure you're not uh, disciplining them because they're two years old. That's our two years old <laughs> act. <laughs> big, big lesson. Gentleness. Gentleness. Michael made a statement. You know, uh, earlier that this this nation is trying to uh, f- cause us to forget about the father. We can't let that happen. We can't let that happen. And then and, and then we, we we have some 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 things here that that principle of the act of gentleness, which says that he has feelings too. You can't cover up those feelings, Dad, Father, men, they are real. Women, it's okay for a woman to cry in a second. But it's not okay for a man to weep. That's not true. Stop it. And and, and not only does he have feelings here, but he's a man of warmth. Man of warmth. That's what verse 7 is saying. And yet, watch this. Paul, Timothy, and Silas is saying this about the Thessalonians. He's saying this about the church. That they cared so much about the church that they fathered them. They had a fatherly reaction to them. Now, watch this. 
when you look at verse 8, now it gets even more. Watch verse 8. Verse 8 says this, and having thus, watch this, a fond affection. Now, 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 this, uh, this fondness comes from the word called favor. A father needs to show favor to the children. I mean, my father showed me so much favor. There were times when he was supposed to spank my bus. He, he just got tired. And so, so go on, boy, get, get out of here. Get, get out of here, man. <laughs> favor. I mean, that brother should have lit me up. But, but, but then here we go. This, this next principle is called affection. See, 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 see men uh, need to show fathers need to show affection beyond sex. Caring, affection. Watch this. There was an emotional attachment. And I don't know any father that don't have an emotional attachment to his wife and his children. It's emotional. It needs to be there. And yet Timothy and Titus and Silas is showing this kind of affection to this church. And then he doesn't stop there. He says what? And as we were well what? Pleased. There is a sense of pleasure in it. It pleased him to show that kind of affection. Oh, oh I, I have no problem wrapping my arms around my weeping daughter, but I also should be able to hug my weeping son. So not only an act, okay, not only an act of gentleness, but also what you see here is healthy, watch this, emotional attachment. Paul is saying this through the Thessalonians, and he says this, I want to impart something to you. So while a father is showing the gentleness and the emotional attachment, he's also saying, I want to share something with you. I want to impart something to you. I have a gift that I want to give you, and I want to stir up the gift in you because you remind me of the gift that is in me. That's to his wife. That's to his daughter. And that's to his son. It stirs it up. In part. And, and, and when he imparts that, he, he's also saying, be, 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 because you have become very dear to us. That word dear means precious. Now watch this. Timothy, Paul, and Silas saw the church at Thessalonica as precious to them, just like a father would see his children precious to him. Same model, same information. So whether you're thinking about your dad now or not, these principles are still the same. If your father never told you he was, you were dear to him, guess what? The Heavenly Father is telling you that you're dear to him. My father always told me how special I was. Always told me how good I could be. Always called my mom Haunty Bun. I thought it was gooey stuff. Get out of here. But, but he was saying those things to not only stroke mom, but he was saying those things to stroke the kids. And Paul and Timothy and Silas is saying the same thing. Watch this about the church. And true leaders say that to the church. True leaders stroke the church. True leaders thank the church. True leaders have a motivation to let the church know how much they care about them. And let me tell you something. You got people here who care about you. And Peter has this demonstrated that, and Michael has demonstrated that to you. And Rick and Johnny and Bill are learning how to do that. Dear to you. You're dear to us. Fatherly, fatherly characteristics. And then when you look here at verse uh, 9, because verse 8 and 7 are about care. 
You know, because he, when he says at the backside of verse 8 that, that we not only gave you the gospel, but we gave you our own lives. Watch this. They went beyond just sharing the gospel. They went beyond the obligation of giving them the word. They said, look at here. I'm going to put my life in front of you. I'm going to give you my very life. I don't have anything to hide. I don't want to act like I got my act together. I don't want to act like I'm perfect. You're going to see me hurt. You're going to see me cry. You're going to see me get mad. You're going to see me get upset. But you're also going to see me love you. We put our lives in front of you. Yes, we did. That's why verse 9 now has so much power to it. Because watch here. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 sits up here and says, hey, now for you recall. He says, now I want you to go back and remember Thessalonians. But I think this is also a daddy sometime reminding the kid, do you have some understanding of what I do to you or do for you? And now before I read this verse 9, I want you to understand something, man. My daddy worked 40 years in Houston, Texas, hot sun. I want y'all to understand some man. The sun will burn anything. So it ain't got nothing to do with your skin. If your skin black, your skin is light, the sun will burn it. And they stopped at 3 o'clock in construction. And he said, because they got up 4 o'clock in the morning, and they started about 5, 30, 6 o'clock, because at the 3 o'clock in Houston was the hottest time of the day. And my daddy did that for 40 years. He took me to work with him. I couldn't do it for three days. And sometimes I had to remember what this man would do for me so that I could become who I am. 40 years, complain not one time. Guess what Timothy, Titus, and Silas is getting ready to say to the Thessalonians? Watch it. Here it is. He says, look, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as to not be a burden for you. I mean, I mean, sometimes you, you just have to tell your kids, you know, you, you went to school, it was snowing, barefoot, you walk back, backwards up the mountain for 30 miles just to go to school. Remember you told your kids that? I mean, you told them that because that's what you were doing. And Paul and, and Timothy and Silas said, wait a minute. Look here. We work day and night. Watch. We were tent makers. Why? Because we didn't want to cause you any burden. We came into your life not wanting you to stop what you were doing to give us any attention. So we went and made tents so that we could take care of ourselves so that we wouldn't hinder you getting the gospel. We did not want to become a distraction. And a lot of times, a parent sometimes need to tell a kid, now, now you, you, you may have all these privileges, but, 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 but let me tell you something. There's a lot of things mom and dad has got to do for you to get those privileges. See? And Paul and Silas and Timothy are saying this to the church. Night and day, labor. And sometimes I think our kids forget. And because sometimes I, I may have given my, my son and my daughter too much. Because they think life is like that. And sometimes you just got to let them realize that they're not privileged in that sense. They too have to work. They too have to put in the time. And a father should do that for their kids. The father should do that for their wives, working night and day, hardship. And so what we see here is, is, is that the, the dad went out and he earned that living, you know. He carried the load. So not only did he have this act of gentleness, not only did he have this emotional attachment, but in verse 9, he has the skill, watch this, of duty and dependence. He passes that on to his children. You got a group of people out here all around the country today who've given up on life. And now they want America to take care of them. Now, this is not true about all of them. 
But I'm, I'm, I'm speaking this word that somebody should speak to the homeless. There are some people who are homeless and they don't really have any control over there. But there are some people who are homeless that are professionals. They've just given up on life and saying, you got to take care of me now. See, a father would not allow that to happen. Because I can remember, man, graduating from Jack Yates High School, proud, uh, getting ready to go to college, man. Came from our commencement. We had our last day of school, took all our robes and went to the beach. The next day I woke up and my daddy said to me, son, he started pulling out the bills. He says, I want you to understand something. None of one of these bills got your name on it. He said, you're out of school now, and I know, son, you're going to be going to college. But what are you going to do in the meantime? You need to go get a job. The next day, I had to go get a job for two months. And he says, well, what I want you to do, son, is I want you to buy groceries for the next month. I got my little paycheck. <laughs> And I bought groceries for the whole house. And that man sent a message to me. He says, man, this is real life. And this is where you are headed. See, all the fun and games were over then. Out of school, we're going to go out and party, 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 party. Then he said, no, buddy, you're going to get a job. You're going to work. I was looking forward to coming to Fort Collins, you know, Vanilla City. Oh, I was ready to give, come here, you know. And that is what Paul was saying to these people. We worked so hard that we didn't want it to become an excuse for you not to hear the gospel. We paid our own dime. We did our own work, even though we could have demanded it. We ask you for nothing for the sake of giving you the gospel. A dad would do that to the children. A dad would do that and say, you, you got to get out and you got to go get something done. And then in verse 10, what you see here, he's saying this, and you are witnesses and so is God. Watch this, how devoutly, uprightly, and blamelessly we behave towards you believers. Now, what does he mean by that? The word devoutly means reverently. We acted before you. How we were, were pious and just before you. We were blameless without fault. And we behaved in a godly manner. Every time I got discipline from my parents, every time my, my, my mom and dad put me in my place, I always saw that they were doing it later years from a godly perspective because they wanted me to be successful 20 years down the road. Okay. Devout. We did it in such a way where we were fearing God when we did it because we knew we were going to be held accountable for how we raised you. Not only uprightly, because we had to be just and we had to be pious, realizing that we too had made some mistakes. And I don't know how many times I would come home and say, well, Billy, parents down the street, you know, let them get away with this stuff. And, and my dad would look at me and son and say, Billy ain't my son. You are. He would make it clear. I'm spanking your butt, boy, because if I don't, there are things in life you think you can get away with. And just tears. I didn't understand until 40 years later. Uprightly. Did it the right way. Did it the right way. You know when parents say, well, it, it, it hurts me more than it hurts you. Well, see, I, I was on the wrong end of that. <laughs> I was on the wrong end of that deal, man. And, and, and so, but, but, but see, Paul and them is saying when, when the Thessalonians looked at them in that three weeks that they were, they were devout men, they were men who were upright, and they were men who were blameless. They didn't come in there peddling the gospel. They, they, they didn't come in there where their life didn't meet the message. So I hope, you know, as we deal with these last few verses, 
that you'll see the fathers do desire to raise their kids and love their wife like Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. And, and, and these, are, these are principles that, that I should look at as a man when I think about my boy and I think about my daughter and I think about my lovely wife who are here. I have to ask myself a question. Every time I make a decision, am I devout? Am I upright? Am I blameless? Am I making this decision out of fear? Am I making a decision out of anger? Am I making a decision out of bad experiences? As a dad, here are these three men treating this church like a father should treat his family. Powerful. Did your father treat you like that? You got to think about that. And sometimes I, I find myself on my knees early in the morning wishing that I could see my dad again who's been dead for 20 some odd years, maybe longer, and just to tell the man how much I love him. You know? And let me tell you something. Guys, I'll say this to you. Telling your family that you love them, you need to do it as many times as you can, a day, as many days as you can. Because I'll tell you something. This next verse talks about the strong influence of a father. This is the conduct. This is the impeccable conduct. But verse 11 brings out the character. And so not only does this father have this act of gentleness, this emotional attachment, this skill of duty, but when you look at verse 10 here, he's talking about the necessity of integrity. He's talking about character that produces conduct and conduct that produces character because I want to do it devoutly, I want to do it uprightly, I want to do it blamelessly, and I want to behave in such a manner. But then watch verse 11. This is really the centerpiece of the message because verse 11 says, just as you know how we were what? Exalting Exalting, that this word exalting means to call somebody upward. Now, my dad used to lift me up, <laughs> but I'm talking about calling somebody upward, calling this kid up, telling this kid how great they can be. Because I tell you something, and moms, look at here, we paid tribute to you a few weeks ago, but this is dad's time. There's something about when a dad says something that makes a huge impact on a kid's life. It's huge. I don't know how many times I've been in prison and have talked to inmates on death row and we sit down and hear their story and at the end of their story, there's something about their relationship with their dad. All kind of stuff. And here in verse 11, what you see is just as you know, we were exalting you. Doesn't mean that that person was in prison because of their father. I'm not saying that. But there's something about that relationship that meant so much for them. Exalting, encouraging, calling them up. That's what Paul and Timothy and Silas was doing to the church at Thessalonica. Watch this. Not only was he calling them up, he was encouraging them. Like I can remember my, my, my daddy wasn't able to come to all of my sporting events. I, it didn't bother me. I just wanted to make sure he heard about what I did because they put it in the paper. And, and one day he came sitting up in the stands. I, was just, I just wanted to impress my dad. I had the worst game of, our, of my whole career in high school. Got beat 24 to nothing, man. I mean, those, those people clobbered us, you know, <laughs> after the game. My daddy looked at me, and, he, yeah, and I, knew, I knew he was just joking because he knew how upset I was, you know. And he said, Otis, uh, you guys ain't that very good, man. <laughs> he said, y'all are bad, but look here, man. Uh, you got something. You got something special, buddy. A year later, Houston Astrodome. Playing the Houston Cougars, Colorado State University. I'm a freshman. 
catch a kickoff, run it back 99 yards for a touchdown. Yeah. My dad was at that game. He was at that game. And he was saying some things to me then that I couldn't understand. And I appreciate it now. Why? Because he was trying to encourage me that song, whatever you do, I see the giftedness in you. And you can be anything that your heart sets to do. Paul was saying this to the people at Thessalonica. Saying, look, we exalt you. Why? Because you saw us get kicked out of town, run out of town in three weeks. And we were gone for several years. We were gone. We weren't there. But you guys still rose to the occasion as church. You guys still held together. Guess what's happening to the church at Thessalonica? Man, they are just having humble appreciation for their father who started that church. And he's saying, man, y'all did a good job without us. And he says, not only that, but he says, man, I was imploring them. See, the word imploring is a very strong, I beg you to do this. There, there are times when a parent has to get a kid's attention and says, I beg you to straighten up. I am asking you to get right because you have no understanding that if you don't get right, there's going to be some things that's going to happen to you. The consequences are going to be devastating. And sometimes a parent has to say that. Stop it. Don't do it. So not only was he exalting them, not only was he encouraging them, but he was imploring them and says, I tried to tell you. Well, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it Merrill Haggard who says, Mama told me, Mama tried? <laughs> Mama tried. But Paul was saying this to the Thessalonians. Last two verses. I was going to take a couple minutes. If verse 7 was the act of gentleness and verse 8 was the emotional attachment and verse 9 was a skill of duty and dependence and verse 10 was the integrity that was brought by the Father, then verse 11 had to be firm and challenging influence in a child's life from a dad, from a father. A demand for discipline, a demand for discipleship, a demand to be equipped. That's what Paul was saying. So when Michael read those Proverbs scriptures to you, Proverbs uh, 4, 1 through 4, it was basically a grandfather's wisdom. Because he said, when I was a child in my father's, and I listened to what he said, and it was wisdom. So if you go back and read Proverbs Four, one through four. That's what you'll get. I listen to him. And, and then when you begin to, to, to look at Malachi, and I want, you, I want to say this to you before we close this out with these last two verses. Did, did, did you know one of the promises in the end times is that last verse in Malachi? You know what God's going to do? God's going to restore the heart of the father to the children and the children's heart to the father. Families are going to change. That fatherly advice is going to resurface. <laughs> fathers and sons are going to be reconciled. Children and fathers are going to be healed. Because you are living in a generation of fatherless children. Unfortunately, that is what has happened in the church. They've taken the father out. And the church has become very passive. Jesus is saying in Malachi, it will be restored. It will be restored. Let's just close this out. Church, are you with me so far? All of these are the desires of a dad. You know why? Because God put it in them. 
I've never met a father who didn't have this in him. Didn't have it in him. And so when you look here at verse 12, it's really where it ends because 13 starts something new. He says, I do all of this. Now watch this. Judah man, I hear you, buddy. He says, look, the, the act of gentleness, the, the, the health of emotional attachment, the, the skill of duty and dependence, the necessity of integrity, the form challenge of influence. And in verse 12 here, look at it. He says, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I tell you what. If I didn't fear my heaven, earthly father, I would have not feared my heavenly father. And I feared my dad. My dad was this tall. My dad wasn't that tall. Now, he had some sons that were six, eight. Mom was a little bit tall. But I feared my dad. You know what that did? That put fear in me for my heavenly father. And he did all of those things he did. Why? So that I would be a godly man. So that I would walk as a man with God in him. That was all the purpose of what my mom and daddy did. So that I would grow up fearing my heavenly father. So that I would grow up being able to love my wife and, and raise my children to fear God as well. So the whole purpose is for me to be like God. That word manner means lifestyle. That word worthy means value in and valued by call, which means calling him to us, him coming to us, and him loving on us. And then it talks about the kingdom and the glory, which means the present reality of God now, here, now. And then he's saying this. Living lives of infinite value. My daddy wanted my life to be impact no matter where I went. And I don't know what my daddy is in heaven or not. I don't know that. I just know my mom told me in his last days he received Christ. But my daddy said, man, walk like you believe and believe like you walk. Keep your head up, son. Keep your head up. Here's the last thing as we close it out. In verse 13, he says, for this reason, we also con constantly thank God that we, that when you receive from us the word of God's message. You accepted it. Not as the word of man. But for what it really is. The word of God. Which also performs its work. It's in you. Who believe. Now. Constantly means constantly. Grateful. Received means, means you welcomed it. The word which means God spoke it. And it performed its work because it had power in it, and you were persuaded. Pure work of God, transforming. That means it was effective because it had a special function, and it was efficient because it produced something with minimal effort. They accepted it to the point that the Thessalonians believed it to the point that they were willing to die for it. So what do we conclude here? We conclude this, that you fathers in here, we all, including myself, want to say thank you for being dads. Thank you for being Dads, it's important that you hear that. It's important that you hear that we know that deep down inside of you, you want to do it God's way. You tried to do it God's way. You didn't always do it right. Some of us, as we begin, <laughs> 
we can see these principles and say, man, this is the kind of man I want my wife to say that I am. This is the kind of father I want my kids to say that I am. I'm going to keep these principles in front of me. I'm going to do everything I can, not only to live with impeccable conduct, but to live with character so that I can pass on to my offsprings so they can take the baton and be more impactful than I was. Paul, Timothy, and Silence said this to the Thessalonians. It became a model for us to live by. And we need to say the same thing to our wives and to our children. Gentlemen and ladies, happy, happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. And if your dad's still alive, why don't you give him a call? Okay? And if he's not, thank God that God used him in your life for you to be who you are today. Proverbs 10. I don't remember the verse. It says, Hatred creates strife, but love covers all transgressions. All transgressions. We're going to sing the chorus of this great song. Would you stand with me, please? This is what we do here at the Church of Fort Collins. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hands to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hands to heaven and praise the Lord. Just the voices. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hands to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hands to heaven and praise the Lord. Lord, we thank you because you're able to do way beyond anything that we could even ask or think of. You are our Heavenly Father. Father, we bless you, we love you, and we honor you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say it. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Go in grace. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Say hello to the littlest, youngest one in the whole place, will you? <laughs>